It is estimated that 100 billion meteors strike our atmosphere every 24 hours. Nearly all of these are extremely small, no larger than a minute grain of sand, and are burned up by friction with the air, and only their ashes fall to the earth. Occasionally, however, a meteor large enough not to be entirely consumed will come through the atmosphere and actually strike the earth. A total of around 1,500 meteorites are known, and about one-third of them are represented in the collection of the American Museum of Natural History. Such collections represent the only concrete messengers from space that come to the Earth. The largest known specimen at Grootfontein in southwest Africa is estimated to weigh about 165 tons. For masses such as this and larger, the impact is terrific. A large body weighing many tons will pierce the atmosphere without being appreciably checked and crash into the ground while moving from 10 to 60 miles a second. In comparison, a rifle bullet's velocity is about a half mile per second. As the mass plunges into the ground, its forward motion is checked in a small fraction of a second. The contacting parts of the meteor and the ground are tremendously compressed, heated, and partly vaporized. This gas and steam from groundwater expands in a terrific explosion, tearing a gaping crater in the earth. About a dozen large craters have been ascribed to meteoric impact. The first crater determined to be of such origin was the meteor crater in Arizona, officially known as the Beringer Meteor Crater, after the owner, Daniel M. Beringer, who with considerable difficulty convinced scientists of his theory of the crater's origin. It is located in Coconino County, Arizona, about 20 miles west of Winslow and 35 miles east of Flagstaff, and fortunately for tourists, just about a half a dozen miles south of U.S. Route 66 on a modern paved highway. Uh, these movies and the meteorite collection on display at this meeting were a gift to the, to the Black River Astronomical Society uh, by the family of the late Debrett D. Bernhardt of Lorraine, one of the founders of our organization. Bernhardt made his first visit to the crater in 1948. He was so fascinated by what he saw that he returned four times. On his second and subsequent visits, he arrived equipped with magnetometers and metal locators. His enthusiasm paid off in the results evident in our display case, which represents less than half of his findings since he was obliged to give the best specimens to the owners. Uh, Bernhardt was fond of recounting the incident of his first attempt at using the Army mine detector. Within a very few minutes after having started to sweep the terrain with the search coil, a very strong signal was heard in the earphones. Frantic digging and scraping to a depth of several inches revealed a slightly oxidized pork and beans tin with a well-preserved Camp Bell's label. Our largest specimen originally weighed more than 13 pounds. Bernhardt sawed, polished, and etched both pieces to show the Widmanstaten lines. The larger piece was returned to the crater where it is now on display in the modern museum and visitor's center recently built at the northeast rim of the crater. In evidence of the enormity of the collision, the crater, situated in a large level plateau of stratified limestone and sandstone, uh, nearly circular, averages 4,100 feet across. The present depth from rim to crater floor is about 600 feet. The rim, 120 to 160 feet higher than the surrounding plain, and one and a half miles in outside diameter, can be seen from a distance of more than 10 miles. It is made up largely of boulders and smaller fragments of limestone and sandstone. Some huge boulders were ejected from the crater and thrown over the rim to distances of more than a mile. Various peculiarities of the crater and rim suggest that the meteor struck from the north at an angle of about 45 degrees and penetrated under the southern rim. A mine shaft and several drill holes sunk near the center of the crater in attempts to locate the main body of the meteor proved disappointing. A churn drill was then driven down through the southern rim of the crater. Below 1,200 feet it passed through a region increasingly rich in meteoritic material and at 1,350 feet struck a region containing 75% nickel iron, which was very resistant to boring. After passing through 30 feet of this material, the drill stuck and remains to this day immovable. A recent electrical and magnetic surveys of the region suggest that a sizable amount of metallic material lies under the southern rim, 
estimates of amounts and locations vary greatly. The question that naturally arises is how large a mass of meteoric iron would be necessary to produce these results, to plow into solid rock and form a crater about four-fifths of a mile in diameter and more than 1,200 feet deep. Since the true crater is filled to one-half its depth with uh, rock fragments that rolled back after the impact. Many physicists have made estimates, and these estimates of the meteor size vary greatly. During the summer of 1956, a Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory expedition to the Beringer Crater spent three months gathering soil samples from locations one-half mile apart in an area eight miles by eleven miles, which were subsequently sifted and the iron particles separated magnetically. Their samplings indicate that the total amount of meteoritic debris around the crater is 12,000 tons. Thus, the weight of the meteorite that produced the crater must have been at least this great. Their ballistic calculations give about the same figures for the mass of a body needed to make a hole as large as the crater. This would indicate that most of the meteorite was broken into fine particles, and they believe it doubtful that any sizable mass lies buried beneath the floor of the crater despite the evidence manifest by the Behringer drilling operations. Ernest J. Opik of the Russian Dorpat Observatory and later director of the Arma Observatory in Ireland, one of the most versatile astronomers of this age, whose favorite subject is meteors, has contributed some of the most important papers on the problem of the formation of meteor craters on the Earth and on the Moon. Measurements are made of a meteor crater to find its depth, diameter, rim height, and the uh, probable mass of the shattered and dislodged rock. From these data, he determines the mass and velocity of the original meteoric body. From the dimensions of the Beringer crater, Opik computed that the volumes of rocky material shattered and ejected by the impact was a mass of about a, of about a billion tons. From the distances at which some of this shattered material was found to have been ejected, he computes the amount of work done in lifting the material out of the crater. But the kinetic energy of the me meteor was expended in many ways besides lifting the material. Heat was produced, which vaporized much of the meteor and melted some of the rock, and part of the kinetic energy was consumed in breaking the rock before it was lifted. Some of these effects must have required far more energy than the lifting did, which alone would have, according to Opik, required a meteoritic mass of 50,000 tons. Since the heat of impact was dissipated in a few hours, it is necessary to resort to estimates of its kinetic energy or momentum. The pressure built up when the meteor entered the atmosphere he computes to be approximately 50 million atmospheres and he further shows that the minimum mass of 50,000 tons required to lift the rock fragments represents only about 2% of the real mass which must have been nearly 3 million tons. Resorting to another method of calculation in which the depth of penetration of a body is used, he arrives at the conclusion that the meteor resembled an iron sphere of about 260 feet in diameter and weighing some two million tons. Most estimates of the mass of the object or objects that smashed into the Earth's surface to form the Beringer crater are based on theoretical reasoning. Some recent calculations indicate masses varying from Jorks uh, 30,000 to 194,000 tons Shoemaker's uh, 63,000 tons, and Opik's 2.5 million tons. A new approach to the problem is possible from recent studies of craters resulting from nuclear and chemical explosions at the Nevada test site. Improved empirical formulae have been derived that allow the yield of a large explosion to be estimated from the measured radius and depth of the crater. From these equations applied to the Behringer crater, it appears that the impact was equivalent to the explosion of 20 million tons of TNT at a point somewhere between the surface and a depth of 400 feet. An upper limit of 1,350,000 tons for the mass can be calculated from these assumptions. Estimates of the impacting meteor size have as many variations as there are theoreticists and formulas applied to the problem. But the one thing everyone seems to be agreed on is that it must have been a hell of a big bang.